My name is Viktor Halasuk. I'm the president of the Ukrainian Association of Rome Club, and today I'm incredibly lucky because I have an honor to moderate the speech of a unique special guest of Kyiv International Economic Forum. That is the Nobel laureate on economy, Joseph Stiglitz. And maybe he doesn't even need to be introduced, but I would still like to say a couple of words about him. Joseph Stiglitz is a professor of the Columbian University in New York. He also has taught in Princeton, Stanford, MIT, Oxford and other leading universities of the world. Professor Stiglitz is one of the most uh, well-known and renowned world economists. He has more than 40 honorable uh, degrees from the universities, including Cambridge and Harvard. He used to be the president of the International Economic Association. He also is included by the Times magazine into top 100 most influential people of the world. In the 90s, Joseph Stiglitz has been working in the administration of the President of the United States of America and even he visited Kiev in 1993 with an official visit. After that, he used to be the chief economist of the World Bank and the senior vice president of this institution. But after the principal and sincere criticism of the um, IMF, uh, policy, he left this position in 2000. But in 2001, Joseph Stiglitz got the Nobel Prize on economy. And in 15 years more, he has become the member of the Roman Club. And today, thanks to Kyiv International Economic Forum, we have a unique opportunity to hear the ideas of Mr. Joseph Stiglitz, as we say, from him directly. Dr. Stiglitz. And pleasure to welcome you at the Kyiv International Economic Forum gathering. We currently have in this room over 100 top influentials from uh, business community and public service, including owners and top managers of the largest Ukrainian companies, members of the Parliament of Ukraine, and also members of the national government. Can you hear us well? Yes, I can. Thank you. Great. So, Dr. Stiglitz, if you don't mind, I will ask you some questions to start with, and after that we will take several questions from the audience. So, the, my, my first question, Dr. Stiglitz, if we look at the stock market, we will see that there has already been a V-shaped recovery. And this appears a bit paradoxical in the light of the real economy indicators. Uh, moreover, Dr. Rubini predicted a 10-year depression. What prospects for the global economy um, are you expecting so far? Well, first, the stock market uh, often doesn't work perfectly in tandem with the real economy. Uh, sometimes uh, when wages are low, profits are high. And when profits are high, the stock market is uh, uh, strong. Uh, right now, one of the reasons the stock market is so high is interest rates are very low. There's been an enormous infusion of liquidity into the economy. The, in the United States, for instance, the federal government has spent uh, uh, more than $3 trillion in support of the economy in uh, pandemic relief. And the Federal Reserve has expanded its balance sheet by another $3 trillion. Well, all that liquidity needs to go someplace. And it's going disproportionately into the stock market. Not everywhere in the stock market, the high tech sectors, Zoom, uh, Cisco, all of these are doing uh, very well. Uh, so um, uh, we have a, a, a distorted view of the economy if we look at the stock market itself. 
uh, the, the real economy right now has bounced back stronger than many people thought, but it's still very weak. And that's why uh, I, I think uh, when Rubini made his prediction, it was at a time when we didn't know whether we were gonna have a vaccine, when we didn't know whether there was an end to this uh, terrible situation. But I think right now we can see the end of the tunnel. We can see the light at the end of the tunnel. We can see that the pandemic, we began uh, the vaccine. Um, we are we're going through a very difficult next two, three, four months. Um, you know, we have lost as many Americans to COVID-19 as we lost in World War II. Uh, that is the scale of the of the devastation of COVID-19. The economic aftermath will be with us for a while. Companies, especially small businesses have gone bankrupt. Airlines are on the edge. Corporate balance sheets have been eroded. Household balance sheets have been eviscerated. Uh, Many poor Americans are particularly in difficult straits. We had a suspension of evictions and that helped enormously. But in now uh, some 35% of Americans are behind in their rent payments, many by many, many months. So it's a very difficult hole that we have to climb out of. Unfortunately, the pandemic uh, support ended in the midsummer, and we needed another support package, but the President Trump was not willing to provide the support, and Congress, the Republican Congress, were not willing to provide the support. They are now in the process of reaching an agreement on a smaller package, not enough, but at least it's better than nothing. Uh, so uh, the damage has been uh, deep, but I do, uh, I'm optimistic uh, that we will be pulling out of it, but it may be uh, a year before we're back to normal. Thank you. So in long term, it sounds quite optimistic. Uh, Dr. Stiglitz, based on your rich international experience, what would you recommend to developing countries in the current situation? How can they break out of this vicious circle of commodity exports, immigration of people and debt dependence? Well, first let me say that, that the developing countries, emerging markets, uh, Many of them have been hit very badly by the pandemic. Uh, they, uh, countries like Latin America, India, their health status is not good. And this COVID-19 goes after people in poor health and crowded conditions, poor uh, health care systems. Uh, they don't have the resources to revive the economy. Uh, the United States uh, pandemic economic support programs represented uh, $3 trillion, as I said before, 15% of GDP. The poor countries simply don't have those resources. So many of the Latin American countries, for instance, and India are really facing a very difficult time. And there are two things that uh, I think the important for the international community to do. Uh, the first is uh, a special issuance of the special drawing rights, kind of money that the IMF can issue. Uh, the head of the IMF has called for an issuance of $500 billion of special drawing rights. 
a lot of support all over the world, except from President Trump and his Secretary of Treasury. They vetoed that along with uh, India. I'm very hopeful that when we have the new administration in Washington on January 20th, uh, we'll uh, provide that, su that support that's needed is so important. The second, you rightly emphasized debt. Many of the countries are much too much in debt and the pandemic pushed them over the cliff. There are going to be many countries facing debt crises and unfortunately, we don't have a good framework for restructuring sovereign debt, international debt. Uh, you, you know some of the difficulties uh, of, of, uh, that that uh, poses. Um, the United Nations in 2015 adopted a set of principles for uh, restructuring sovereign debt. Overwhelmingly, well, only six countries opposed, but they included two of the most powerful, the United States and, and uh, uh, the UK. And so unfortunately, at this juncture, we don't have the framework for restructuring sovereign debt. Uh, I hope that there will be some pressure for the international community uh, for that kind of restructuring for some of the most afflicted countries. Now, the broader question that you raised is a really important one. Many countries around the world have remained too dependent on natural resources. Uh, what makes for the wealth of nations is uh, industrialization, uh, education, uh, the uh, advance in, in uh, uh, knowledge, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, and unfortunately, there's a phenomenon called the natural resource curse. And countries that remain too dependent on natural resources often wind up uh, not doing as well, even if they have an abundance of natural resources. Uh, they are marked by what we call rent-seeking, uh, and uh, not the kind of real investment that I talked about a minute ago. So I think absolutely the core of success is, is moving away from this reliance on natural resources. Thank you. Dr. Stiglitz, uh, yeah. a lot of entrepreneurs and economists in developing uh, countries see the way forward in implementing uh, the industrial policy learning from the best international uh, practice. They advocate for introducing such uh, economy development tools as, like industrial parks, development bank, export credit agency, uh, some incentives for localization and so on. But the IMF and the European Union, in fact, are traditionally blocking these initiatives. What do you think of the developing uh, countries' ideas of their agenda in this field? Well, this is an area in which there's been tremendous change uh, in the last 22 decades. Uh, when I was uh, at the World Bank, uh, institutions like the IMF opposed uh, industrial policies. Um, but uh, today there's been a shift in view. Uh, interestingly, one of the chief economist that followed me, uh, actually put at the center of the World Bank's policy, promotion of industrial policies. And it's very interesting in the United States, both parties are now agreed that there's an important role for government to promote industrial policies. Uh, there's been a shift in the intellectual uh, framework, uh, an important book uh, by Mariana Masakuto talks about the entrepreneurial state, the role of the state in promoting entrepreneurship, and the fact that in the United States, for instance, it was the government that promoted the internet, that did the basic research, that developed the first browsers, 
Uh, and if you look at every one of the main sectors that has been successful, behind it is a government effort, often at a very basic research, but often uh, broader support. So I think uh, the mindset is beginning to change. One of the areas in which this change has been most dramatic uh, has been in the area uh, of promoting a green economy. Uh, we, there's an understanding that, that uh, this is an existential issue for the whole world. We, we have to reduce our carbon footprint. And the markets are not doing that on their own. And the result of that is there are concerted government policies, even in Europe, uh, even in the United States, to promote uh, that kind of green transition. Uh, and that goes on at every level. For instance, in my state, New York State, we have now a green development bank. Uh, so you think of a, uh, a development bank as a World Bank for developing countries, the EBRD for the economies in transition. But uh, we now have a, a green bank in, in, uh, in New York State uh, to help promote uh, the green transition. And uh, many other states, many other places around the world uh, have understood the importance of these kinds of developmental institutions. In the past, there were problems, but we've identified those problems and we've worked to create ways to avoid those kinds of problems, for instance, associated with corruption or, or insider dealing. Thank you. There has always been a global competition for investment and the current situation with the COVID even makes it harsher. Uh, all these kind of uh, lockdowns and, 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 and so on. Meanwhile, developing countries neither have the best infrastructure nor the best institutions in place. How can they compete to attract investors? Well, I think uh, the first thing is to what you just said, uh, try to create uh, a an environment with infrastructure, an educated population, uh, a hardworking population. Uh, every country has its strengths and uh, trying to uh, persuade others of the what those strengths are. Understand what are the sectors, industries, companies uh, which for which those strengths are most important. Uh, that's a, the essential uh, area. Uh, but uh, I've always been uh, amazed at the wealth of entrepreneurship that I see in every corner of the world. And uh, uh, people seeing ideas that were successful in one place and bringing them to another. Uh, so it's the exchange of ideas in many ways that is pivotal in uh, bringing these investments to fruition. Uh, the author of the best-selling book, uh, Principles, Ray Dalio from Bridgewater Associates, names three major forces to shape uh, the new world order. It's creating a lot of debt and money, widening of wealth gap, and the rise of the new world power, China, challenging the existing one, the US. Dr. Stiglitz, what is your take on that? Maybe you see some other mega trends shaping the new economic reality? Well, I, I think there are several. I think the changing uh, geopolitics, geoeconomics, is one of the important things going on. Uh, the a world dominated by uh, one or two superpowers uh, is a world of the past. Uh, the 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 
they're, they're, we're mo moving in much more into a, a uh, world with multiple uh, power centers. And uh, it's going to be difficult uh, to adapt to that. Um, I remember a, a few years ago when in um, 2015 it was, in the standard ways in which people rank countries, which is called PPP, Purchasing Power Parity, not the official exchange rate, but taking into account differences in cost of living in different countries, uh, um, the data that had been compiled by the experts at the World Bank showed that China, in this measure, PPP, was larger than the United States. And neither China nor the United States was happy. Uh, the United States did not want to become number two, and China at that particular moment didn't want to stick its head up because it knew that if it stick its head up, uh, people would start uh, criticizing it. So it was an interesting moment in history five years ago. Uh, things have changed a lot since then. Uh, but the point I want to raise is that we are in a new geopolitics. Inequality that he mentioned is a second very important driver of the difficulties that the world is facing today. Uh, I think expect some of the ugly politics that we've seen in some parts uh, of the world. But a third thing that I would have put on my list is technology, innovation. Uh, the transformation in our societies that is going on very rapidly, artificial intelligence. Uh, and uh, that will interact with uh, the other two uh, because uh, success in these new technologies will play an important role in the new geopolitics. And uh, if we don't manage the new technologies well, they could exacerbate our inequalities. Thank you. Dr. Stilgitz, I would like to particularly ask you in more detail on the inequality factor. We see more and more inequality uh, between the countries worldwide on the one hand and between people at the national level at the same time. And it looks like technological development only fuels this process additionally. What does it mean for the future of economy in long term? And where is the limit to inequality? Well, uh, I think uh, that inequality is not inevitable. Uh, some degree of inequality is, but not the level of inequality that we have today. Uh, much of the inequality is fed, uh, is a result of uh, malfunctioning of the economy. We have market power, monopoly. We've uh, undermined the bargaining power of workers. Uh, we have have flaws in our corporate governance. Uh, we've given, I mentioned before, the problems of rank seeking. We've given too much scope to rank seeking. Uh, and in many, many of the wealthy people in the country are not the people who are the most important innovators, but the people who are the best exploiters of others, uh, the best uh, in learning, uh, the best uh, rank seekers, we might say. So, uh, and the result of that rank seeking is that you get slower economic growth. So uh, it used to be thought that there was a what was called the big trade-off. You could only have more equality at the expense of lower growth. I wrote a book in, a few years ago called The Price of Inequality. And the thesis of that book was that in fact, if we have a society with more equality, we can actually grow uh, better and grow faster. And that view, which I put forward in my 2012 book, has now become widely accepted by the IMF, by the OECD, 
uh, by the World Bank, uh, by most econ economists. Today. So, uh, in fact, uh, if we uh, uh, create a more equal society, which includes uh, having a new set of rules, a more effective antitrust, uh, uh, but also uh, uh, better education systems to give more opportunity to other to to those who uh, have lower income, uh, we we will be able. Uh, to grow the economy more, and we'll have more shared prosperity. Thank you. Dr. Stiglitz, you just mentioned that uh, the global economic power is obviously shifting uh, away from the West towards Asia, and China rise is, is a very bright example. And we have already reached the point at which most of the economic growth is generated in non-Western countries. Who may be the world economic leader in the 21st century? Well, I think I think uh, we're as I said before, we wouldn't we shouldn't be looking for a single country. I think we have to think about this as a multipolar world. Um, also, let me emphasize that my belief uh, that the core of long-term economic growth is innovation and uh, development of knowledge. And I think in the long run, uh, that could only be done in a free society. So from my perspective, um, the countries that do not have democratic governments are going to find it more difficult. So, that is one of the strengths of uh, Western Europe, of the United States. The United States almost lost uh, that sense of democracy. I do really believe that Trump uh, uh, was at the uh, verge of uh, weakening of our democracy, uh, calling into question the elections when uh, absolutely clear this has uh, uh, been well-conducted election uh, process. Um, so uh, I think if the United States can maintain its democracy, if it's able to uh, maintain its strong universities, its research centers, uh, I think uh, that the United States with Western Europe will be the center of innovation and that will enable them to uh, maintain uh, a very strong position in the global economy. Thank you. Dr. Stilgis, as soon as you are a member of the Club of Rome, I would uh, like to particularly ask you on the sustainable development agenda. Should it be introduced as a very central and core part of the national economic policy in the developing countries, or maybe it's uh, premature, or maybe it is too, sophist too sophisticated issue, and uh, they should have an old good economic growth and uh, then shift to the uh, sustainable development? What's your take on that? So I think sustainable development is at the core of all countries in the 21st century. Uh, I think that countries that uh, begin earlier on a sustainable development trajectory are going to be advantaged uh, in the coming years. Let me just give you an example. Um, we, we're moving uh, increasingly to renewable energy. Uh, those countries that understand those new technologies based on renewable energy will have a comparative advantage. Uh, it, the reality is that the world will, I believe, begin to uh, impose cross-border taxes on products made in a dirty way. Uh, Europe has extensively discussed that. I, it's be beginning to be discussed in the United States so that countries that have their 
industrial base based on uh, the old fossil fuel uh, will be a disadvantage. Uh, they'll be behind the game. And so uh, I think that, that uh, you can uh, leapfrog by going ahead. Uh, and, you know, we see some of this in, uh, in Africa where uh, the old style uh, big electric generators are very expensive, difficult, but you can have uh, decentralized electricity generation uh, bringing electric power to places that you never would have been able to do it uh, in the old technology. Thank you. Dr. Stiglitz, uh, is there any chance for developing countries to succeed without uh, clear strategies and uh, without deliberate economic policy on their side? Maybe laissez-faire is an alternative and uh, the invisible hand of the market may uh, bring prosperity to uh, these countries. Uh, no, laissez-faire has never worked. Uh, uh, the, the reason uh, that uh, the countries uh, like the United States and uh, Europe are where they are is that there has been uh, strong support for the government in investments on infrastructure, technology. Uh, we've been talking about the high tech sector based on the internet, uh, medicine, uh, amazing feat of the discovery of the vaccine, development of the vaccine in one year's time, less than one year's time. That was all based on government funded basic research. Of course, the private sector played a very important role in bringing it to the market doing the last mile. But all that they all their work was based on government funded research. Uh, you need an education system uh, which gives that opportunity for everybody, no matter how wealthy their parents are, that requires government. Uh, you need uh, government to make sure that the rules of the game are the right rules. Uh, monopoly stifles comp uh, innovation and growth. And so you need a strong competition laws. Uh, so when I think about what has made uh, the United States uh, a strong economy in the period of our most rapid economic growth, it was a result of strong government activities. Um, yes, there were taxes, high taxes sometimes, because to finance infrastructure, to finance health, finance education, uh, they don't co these are, uh, the, you have to pay for them. But it is only on the basis of that that you can achieve prosperity. Thank you. Dr. Stiglitz, uh, if you have to choose uh, the one most and the foremost priority for, the, uh, for some developing country, should it be education or economic policy? What, what will be your choice? Oh, I think you have to do both. I don't think you can make that kind of choice. I think um, you have to have a policy framework that is conducive to uh, investment, uh, uh, you have to have a policy framework that's conducive to competition. Uh, you, you, you need a rule of law, but uh, your most important resource in any country is your human resource. And if you don't have a well-educated labor force, you're not gonna have prosperity. And so, you know, the, the, uh, we often talk about in America, we have a very divided country. Uh, part of the country is doing enormously well, growing rapidly, part is not doing very well. And uh, that matches very strongly with part of the country has a very strong education system. Some, some of our country does not. And we have the same legal framework the same laws, but without that good education system, uh, you don't prosper. 
Thank you. Dr. Stiglitz, uh, thank you for your brilliant insights. And let us take just several quick questions from our honorable audience. Uh, Ruslan Spivak, please. Um, Mr. Stiglitz, first of all, thank you very much for this great delivery and uh, very valuable thoughts. Uh, partly, you have already touched the topic of the world order during your uh, conversation. However, I want to, uh, to talk with you a little bit more about this. So, uh, as for me, currently, the world economy is experiencing a certain quest for a balancing. So, we are witnessing trade wars, geopolitical games, COVID and tech-related uh, disruptions, uh, emerging powers, etc. So, we can say that the times of Bretton Woods actually passed away. And uh, actually, the world economy is facing two main threats, as for me. So the first is continuing this equilibrium between spending and saving, which we already touched a little bit. And uh, I prefer to call it usually like a, the casino economy. And the second one, this is the return to the multipolar uh, world, uh, which state of instability, as for me, is very close to what we experienced before the first world war period. So on your opinion, when and what kind can be the new world order, and uh, how will be the new world economy architecture will, will look like in this case? Thank you very much. Yeah, well, I hinted a little bit about my thoughts about that before. I think we're going to be moving to a more multipolar world, uh, not a world which is dominated by one or two or three countries. Many of the problems that we faced are global. So uh, we've gone through a very difficult period where people like President Trump tried to undermine multilateral cooperation. But we aren't going to be able to solve the problem of climate change, pandemics, um, without global cooperation. And in fact, even in the area of economics, uh, much better to have cooperation in writing rules of the game that are fair for all than engaging in a trade war. Uh, you know, the irony is that he began a trade war with China uh, right after he became the president. And um, four years later, uh, the trade deficit with China is the same as it was four years earlier. Uh, the multilateral great trade deficit of the United States is larger than before the trade wars began. Uh, it didn't solve any problems. It made things worse. So I've been a very big critic of some of the rules of the game, uh, uh, some of the provisions in the WTO. Um, but uh, what I think we've come to appreciate is you need to have rules. You need a rule of law internationally, just like you need a rule of law within your country. And what we need to do is to uh, work together internationally to make sure that those rules are fair. One of the problems was that to a too large extent, multinational corporations in the United States and to some extent in Europe, dictated many of the terms of uh, the international agreements. And so they helped the big multinationals, but they were not good for small and medium-sized enterprises, for workers, for developing countries. Uh, and uh, that's why I'm actually hopeful that a move to a multipolar world will will provide a better foundation for global cooperation. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Stiglitz, uh, dear colleagues, I think we've done. And Dr. Stiglitz, thank you so much for uh, such a useful and informative and important insights you, you just shared with us. We've got a lot of uh, ideas to consider. And thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.